artificial intelligence. So um, it is actually considered one of the most important technical developments of our times. At the same time, it's also considered a threat to, uh, to humanity. So what is AI? Uh, I have been uh, uh, looking for like different definitions and what is interesting is the origins of, of AI. It started as a scientific discipline. So scientific disciplines, just as astronomy, as uh, chemistry, physics, or mathematics. It started in the late 1950s, and um, that means uh, almost 70 years ago. So it's, uh, you could say it's relatively old. Um, and what happened back then was that a generation of scientists, of mathematicians, and also philosophers um, aim to um, sti simulate uh, different forms of intelligence using machines, and this was largely inspired by the science fiction that they were watching and uh, engaging with in the 1920s, uh, where the concept of the humanoid robots uh, was starting to be incited in, in movies as Metropolis. And since then, all these 70 years, uh, the term AI, artificial intelligence, has been equally um, used by computer scientists, by new media artists, by tech journalists, investors, um, and politicians to refer uh, in multiple and very different ways to a fascinating speculation. And I want you to stick with this concept of a speculation. So what is this speculation about? That cognitive cognitive functions as learning, as reasoning, as perception, or even creativity can be described and modeled with such accuracy that it would be possible to reproduce them using computers. That's the speculation. And what happened during the last 10 years in the 2010s is that the exponential growth of computational power, the planetary scale of data collection technologies, and a data-driven media culture have enabled a wide range of applications of AI systems in areas uh, such as natural langu language comprehension, speech recognition, and the most well-known these days, image generation. This is, uh, has been accelerating the adoption of, uh, of, of these systems across industries, across sectors, and um, also bringing the automation of processes, of, of tasks, uh, and decision making at the scale that is uh, unprecedented. So what is, what is the, the thing, the issue? That it is giving rise to crucial and interrelated ethical, societal, existential, but also environmental challenges. We can think of the augmentation of systemic racism, the augmentation of disinformation, and the augmentation of negative environmental and social impacts of technologies. For example, did you know that training a single AI system can emit more than 100,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide, and that the use of AI tech across all sectors is producing similar amount of emissions as the aviation industry, and it is increasing exponentially. So this is why uh, I am uh, the Creative Research Lab that I co-founded, and Elisaba. We are joining forces to create a pioneering master program in design for responsible AI. It's a part-time and a low residency program for designers, journalists, artists, strategists, and any other uh, uh, tech worker uh, that is uh, looking to understand and investigate the, uh, art, the field of artificial intelligence, the concept of artificial intelligence as a socio-technical system, so social and technical system, uh, studying also the, the impacts, the many different impacts that uh, these systems are having and will have in society and the planet while designing frameworks, methods, tools, narratives uh, for a responsible development, a responsible deployment, governance, and a responsible usage of AI tools. And uh, an important part of, of launching this, uh, this master for both IAM and Elisaba is to open public conversations about these topics, uh, particularly between pre-creative uh, practitioners uh, as, as yourselves. Um, and tonight we are, well, very lucky uh, because we have one of the most cited authors in the world in digital culture and new media in the room. He's an artist, a writer, and one of the most influential digital culture theorists in the world. He has been working with computer media since 1984. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> He's a pioneer in computational analysis and visualization of massive cultural visual data sets in the humanities. And uh, he founded in 2007 the Cultural Analytics Lab, uh, where well, he 
kind of started a critical studies on the thing that is appearing in the newspapers in our screens every day today, generative AI. So with that said, uh, I invite you to give a warm welcome with an applause to Lev Manovic. Welcome. <laughs> Screen, please. No. Can, 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 can somebody please switch to my laptop screen? No? No, maybe not. Um, buenas noches, amigos. Uh, I really don't know why you're all here. I mean, how exciting can it be AI? This is not Blackpink concert exactly. Uh, that's what I would stand for. Uh, and uh, let me tell you right away, there is one message, you can, uh, one piece of information you can get from a stock is don't be afraid of AI. AI never existed. It's a changing perception. Uh, uh, what you should be afraid is like real things like Putin, who completely lost his mind, right? Because when I was growing up in Soviet Union in the 70s, and even during Stalin time, you know, Russia, while it, you know, ideologically, believed or pretended to believe in global revolution, right? But eventually communism will come everywhere. It actually tried to be friends with capitalist countries because it needed right, currency, you know, and whereas obviously Putin doesn't even try to pretend. So this is a real threat, you know. AI is it's what journalists want to want to um, you to think about. And uh, the reason it never existed is that uh, the historians of AI talk about a thing called AI effect. And the idea of AI effect is that, of course, in a very general sense, AI refers to uh, use of machines, currently digital computers, but perhaps some other machines in the future, which would simulate uh, human cognitive capacities, right? So before we had mechanization, uh, you know, motors, which made possible development of industrial society, right, which simulate our mechanical movements, our heart, our arms, our legs. And then since the 50s, we have so-called AI, artificial intelligence, which is a simulation of human ability to think, to remember, right, to understand, to make sense of images. And since 2010, since the development of what I would call cultural AI or aesthetic AI, also our ability to make cultural media and to even figure out what we like, what we don't like to have aesthetic judgments. So the idea of AI effect refers to the curious phenomena that whenever some problem gets solved in AI, it's no longer considered to be AI. So AI always refers to something which we haven't solved yet, which is maybe we are on the kind of brink on the horizon. So let's say maybe 10 years ago, AI was referring to language translation. Even one day, right, you open your Google or your favorite browser and translation works almost, right, almost perfectly and we no longer think of it as AI. Or we have search engines, right? So when you think about search engine, you know, Google, know, Yahoo, whatever you want to use, uh, even Yandex, uh, it's doing something not just human, it's doing something which is meta-human, right? So I'm asking it, can you find me web pages, right, which are most relevant to this particular question? And in milliseconds, it brings me a listing, right, of millions of pages. There is no human which, 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 which can do it. So that's not really simulation of human abilities, it's simulation of some kind of superhuman abilities. Imagine, right, factories of millions and millions of humans which are very rapidly doing it and then doing the job of a search engine, right? But again, we no longer think of this amazing ability of search engine as AI. So now we think of AI as AI is making art, maybe AI is making graphic design, AI is making architecture, it's almost as good as me, or it's already better than me, it's already much better than my professor, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then once this is solved, AI will be something else, right? Um, and how can you be afraid of something which is like a typewriter, right? You're not afraid of typewriters, so how can you be afraid of AI? Um, in my talk, um, I will share with you some ideas, proposals, questions, provocations about uh, the recently emerged visual AI medium, 
right? It goes by different terms, you know, visual AI, image AI, uh, generative visual media. I can use all these terms interchangeably. And uh, if you, by chance or by mistake, have been kind of following me on social media, uh, I started to post with ideas last August. And sometimes I kind of post them whenever they occur to me. Because like all the other writers, I have a fear of white page, but I don't have fear of Facebook. <laughs> you know, so for me, like I start writing something when I'm posting it, and then after it's posted, I see first likes, I go and I change it, and then somebody makes a brief comment. I say, oh, let me actually go change the post. Uh, so I kind of like to write in interactive mode using social media, and then eventually I collect all these posts into the articles and books. And what you'll see today is a few of these posts uh, which I'll present, maybe not the most even interesting ones, but what I had time to prepare as a presentation and make the slides. Uh, and uh, this is how it looks, right? I want to show you a bit of a kitchen. So, you, okay, if you want to be afraid of AI, you, you know, but at least after this talk, you're not going to be afraid of writing. You cannot be good writers, right? So uh, what I do is I use social media because somehow it's not scary. It's not like a blank page in Microsoft Word, right? And I make this post. Right. You know, and a number of them, right? So some posts are about beautiful Barcelona and amazing Gaudi, and other posts are okay we need, uh, about about uh, these ideas. And then I collect them all, right? And then here is like all these posts I've done, right, since last August. So numbers, right, from number one last August to today. And then I'm now like trying to figure out how to put them in book chapters. And uh, maybe it'll be two book chapters or chapter three. And what is this book? Well, uh, it's now a way to get rid of fear. Because writing books and getting books published by academic presses is like really terrifying, you know? <laughs> like my last book, Cultural Analytics, I sent the manuscript to MIT Press, which I put together in six weeks, right? In uh, uh, August of 2016. And the book came out in October 2020. So it looked like, right, four years. And after I sent a manuscript of 100,000 100, words, uh, they eventually edited it and sent me edited version, which had 13,000 edits. I said, I will never, ever do it again. So what I'm doing instead is, uh, you know, just writing a book, and whenever we finish chapter, just put it online. And this is not scary, because most my, or my typical audience I address my work to, yeah, some kind of young undergraduate design student you know, in uh, Barcelona, or young, I don't know, web designer in, uh, you know, in Guangzhou, right, or in Bratislava, somebody who is English is not first language, just as mine. So what do I care if MIT Press wants to make my English perfect? Most of my audience doesn't know it anyway, right? <laughs> anyway, so this is the chapters which were written, you know, before the explosion of generative media in the middle of last year. So later this week, I'll add another chapter, and maybe another chapter here. So you'll find this all online. Well, let's now actually go to the talk. Um, so um, one thing I also have to tell you before I start, a second, okay, a bit hard to see anything here, okay, is that, you know, during this COVID period, like many of you have participated in many Zoom events, and I gave many Zoom talks online, but I forgot how to do it physically. And this is completely overwhelming. I feel like I'm going to jump from a plane without parachute. Uh, and uh, it's also accelerating. Now I understand what was missing from our life these three years. So I actually did something I haven't done for like 25 years. I actually printed my, my paper <laughs> um, because I'm so scared of you uh, and excited at the same time. So uh, so first part of the talk, I'm actually going to go through some of these points and actually read. If it completely sounds like nonsense or boring, you just tell me. I'll throw it away. Even the last part of the talk, I'm hoping to uh, share with you some of many, many art projects I've been creating with AI and also drawing while limit yourself to idiotic computers since last August. And the projects both illustrate some challenges, some questions I had about AI, but we also about other things, right? We're not just restrictions on my fears, we're about my life uh, and where I am today. So one billion Rembrandts inside AI image synthesis revolution. Um, so as you know, but just to remind you, uh, last summer was a kind of kind of special summer of uh, generative media and even most respected, most conservative publications like New York Times, 
those you know kind of typical consumers like you know hundred years old living on the Upper East Side, even they completely forgot you know their usual city stone and got you know started to write with completely kind of right like kind of things as well by five year olds. Image generators like Dali E, Majority Stable Diffusion, have made it possible for anyone, which means anybody in this room, to create unique. How can you write such nonsense, right? I mean, Gaudi can create unique things, like one in a million, right? <laughs> to create unique hyperrealistic images just by typing a few words in a text box. And, uh, you know, there are many, many quotes like that. And this excitement continues. And I think everybody I know, my friends, architecture theorists, my professors, your professors, people who should just focus on their grandchildren, we all started using these tools and posting. And it was really amazing, kind of like, it was almost like 1968, the summer of love, except I wasn't around, I was eight years old, right? I regret very much. Um, so now, and when I noticed, like towards the new year, people I talked to, they said, Lev, you know, these tools are not as amazing as before. They are amazing, but we have limitations. We both have affordances, and you know, we have blind alleys. So now we have a bit of a distance, and it's a bit like what happened with postmodernism, right? Those of you who old enough who remember postmodernism was this idea in the 1980s that now we live in this kind of post-history post-art, and artists, architects, designers are going to combine all the different styles uh, because everything becomes horizontal. Of course, we didn't know that the web is going to come a few years later and make postmodernism trivial. And then now I look back at postmodernism, it's just like a particular style, a very ugly style. And something like this, I think, is happening with mid-journey and stable diffusion. Now we look back at our images, we're like, oh my god, I wish I didn't post that. <laughs> anyway, so we'll talk about that. Now, uh, What's also interesting is that this moment, this kind of excitement about uh, AI generative media coincides with our art world finally discovering and getting excited about so-called digital or computer art. It starts around 2017, 2018 with uh, Sotheby's, you know, and Philips and all the other auction houses starting to have auctions about generative art. And now uh, the most right, famous, respected, rich, art galleries in the world, such as Pace and Gagosian, represent digital artists. And I think this is the first kind of blue chip gallery in New York, this exhibition which opens right now. Uh, so it's kind of works which were done by, with, Dali, with Dali, maybe even Dali one, I don't know, because it looks a bit dated. But I like that we chose this kind of work, right? So it's some kind of simulation of historical photography, right, or street photography. And this person, he's not even an artist, he is like a documentary filmmaker who made film about AI. And now he's exhibited like in the world top gallery, so also interesting thing. Anyway, so we can see how even like top chip gallery, you know, top, top blue chip galleries get into the game. Um, and then um, this is a press release, right? And I like this press release because, you know, of course we have smart people working for these galleries. So it doesn't say that this is the most amazing development from Renaissance, like New York Times. It's more, right, the more subtle. And what we say is that well, this development of generative media pro, uh, right, generates a kind of debate which we haven't seen. Uh, it, it, it forces us to question things in a way which we haven't seen since postmodernism. And that's kind of interesting, right? That's interesting. Okay. So uh, before we get uh, into the four points, I want to present again a few more sketches for a kind of possible archaeology or genealogy or futurology of visual media. Right, every time a new media technology being invented, it uh, encourages us to reevaluate and rethink what came before. Now, this is, I apologize, it is uh, Western centric. I'm trying to figure out how to complicate it. And of course, I can also put like 40 things there. So this is just for very quick consumption at a 7.45 in Barcelona lecture. Uh, but uh, I wanted, the idea of a slide, right, to simply to communicate the idea that this AI generative media, it looks like a very important thing. Of course, it's possible that tomorrow something else comes along and we say this is like postmodernism, postmodernism, it was actually nothing. It was just a mistake. But probably not. Right? So print, so people making prints, you know, caves, drawing around the same time, lens-based imaging, uh, supposedly goes back to actually also uh, supposedly was in China, uh, camera obscura, camera lucida, and photography, even photography, digital photo photography, right, 1830, 
digital photography 1990, and computational photography is ongoing. And what I mean by this is, right, I mean, your, your camera and your phone doesn't take photographs. I mean, don't be mistaken, right? For example, you know, it takes the like, continuous images, and when it composites them, taking best parts of each photograph, and what you see. So it's not digital photography, it's computational photography, right? But it's still lens-based. And when I think the key development after that, or at least the one which is close to my heart is 3D computer graphics, right? Use of algorithms to simulate perspective, reflectance, shadows, and so on from 1960. And when I guess we have AI generative image, and if we look a bit historically, nothing starts today. Uh, around, around, around 2014, we, we see the first papers. So that's one. And, and, and another thing I want to speculate about so, how to call this thing, right? Because generative media is kind of awkward, right? It may be a good name for some foodie restaurant, right? Uh, but there are already way too many foodie restaurants in Barcelona. Like, I just tomorrow want to get some, I just, I, I can't go to eat anymore here. It's like too sophisticated. I just want to get some bread and some yogurt and don't live on hotel, right? I can't have this more deconstructed bravos anymore. You know, it's just too much, right? <laughs> anyway, so I was thinking, right? AI image, generative image, latent image, latent image can be nice, uh, meta image, probabilistic image, but I like statistical image. Unfortunately, it was already proposed by Paul Berillo in his 1994 book, Relation to CV. But I like this last tool, because I think uh, if we use this term generative image, it also, of course, works very well for like 3D computer graphics, right? You put some numbers, you have some algorithms, and the computer generates image. So it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really capture very well what is different about AI image. So maybe what's interesting about probabilistic image, statistical image concept is that, you know, wait, you know how it works, right? Okay, let me explain to you in one second, right? Um, so, so a computer given uh, hundreds of millions or a few billions, depending on the, which company, which lab is doing it, uh, images and their descriptions, right? So you know, on the web, people put descriptions when they post images for blind people. Right, so now these descriptions are using, you know, are having a different life. And then the computer kind of learns how to associate images and these descriptions. So it learns this kind of space of these associations. And when you put a new description, it generates a new image and vice versa, right? So it basically predicts what kind of image should have existed, right? What, what kind of image should exist given this description. So this idea that image is a prediction, right? Image is statistical, image is probabilistic. I'm not going to look. I, I will still be your friends if you use the term generative media because I'm also using it today, but maybe it's a better term, right? Uh, and then uh, last thing before getting to the meat of things um, is that, of course, I will be mostly talking about a particular method which is most popular today, uh, but it's only one of many methods, right? So. When we think about synthetic visual media, right, uh, 2017, 2018, we have gone. Uh, now we have image to image, right, uh, also, but text to image is now most popular, right? And as you know, literally two weeks ago, Midjourney introduced uh, another feature which table diffusion already had. So now you can put the image, it will try to guess the prompt of a text which you would use to make this image. So again, this idea of probabilities. And also you can do text to animation, et cetera. So while the talk is focused on uh, text to image, it's just one of many methods, okay? So finally, um, so I assume that everybody tried me journey at least once. Some of you stick to it, some walked away, saying oh, it's nonsense, but that's just because you didn't spend enough time. Uh, but those of you who, <laughs> who haven't done it, uh, the reason I kind of focus on me journey, it's a great, great system for studying visual culture. Right, because normally you get software like Photoshop or something else, use it in your computer, and I don't really have access right, to your desktop. But here, uh, the company, the lab, Midjourney, decided that we want people to learn from each other. And uh, for now, right, since last August, until, since last July until today, you interact with the software using a particular social media system called Discord, Discord server, and when you see, right, you see hundreds of our people at the same time typing with text prompts, even with the AI generating images, right? So this, this version you get four images. I think if you pay more, you get 16 images. And you can go into any of these channels and see people doing it. 
And while I was using the system to make my own images and to experiment with it as a way to make my own artworks, it was also an amazing way to study this particular moment in digital visual culture and AI culture. I was lurking, right, and kind of seeing what people were doing and seeing trends, seeing how things change, right? Um, so it's a very, very right, unique moment, which may not last forever, where you can actually can witness, right? It's like as though well you're walking around, you know, dozens of art schools or hundreds or thousands of art schools, and you can kind of look behind the, um, the sh right, the shoulders of the students and kind of see like what they're drawing, right, or what they're thinking even, right? Because in fact, it's false, right? It's false because of sentences. Um, okay, so, uh, and then if you like particular image, you can make it bigger, or you can make variations and continue, so the same prompt can create more variations. Again, I'm doing it very briefly because I think by now everybody knows how it works. Uh, okay, and then, uh, you know, the kind of images you see people create are very particular. Often they have this kind of fantasy, uh, concept art, video games, images, but that's not the reflection of software, it's reflection of kind of popular imagination, uh, which is very different from what people do on Instagram, and why these kind of images are coming out from AI today by millions of users, that's an interesting question, which I don't have a complete answer, but again, those of you who haven't seen our stuff, you can also do all other stuff with software, right? So for example, you can make you know, particular, you, know, you can basically simulate effects of dozens of our media, and you can even simulate effects, right, of different types of photography. And this is actually a screenshot from last summer, since when things became more sophisticated. This is using, I think, Dali E, uh, whereby you know, ch putting different terms, different uh, descriptions in the prompt, you can get it to simulate effects of different photography, right? Which is also interesting. So we can say it's also maybe after photography, digital photography, computational photography, it's a fourth type of photography. It's a kind of like cameraless photography, right? Le because you, know, uh, you can do it and you can create more and more realistic, especially coherent spaces uh, and simulate different artifacts. And the fact that you're always simulating uh, media came before, it's also very interesting, right? It's historicity, okay. Uh, and then that's also interesting so this is my screenshot from Instagram, where I typed me during architecture. I think it was around February or October of last year. And you can see how things are Zaha Hadidi, Zaha Hadidi, right? But kind of nice, right? Kind of interesting, kind of imaginative. And you can see it's more and more people, as normal people, as the masses, or as Jean Patria used to call them, silent majorities, uh, start using the tools. And as the tools allow you for more realism, things become more prosaic, more boring, more cliche. So I did the screenshot just before the lecture, looks like this, right? And this, I think, a very good example. Uh, and I'm not saying that the process will continue forever, but at the moment, what I see very clearly is that as technically, with AI systems become better and better, the kind of stuff people do with them potentially is getting, you know, to a certain extent, more and more boring, right? And that's an amazing paradox, right? So technical sophistication, more visual coherence, more realism, and uh, a certain decrease in imagination, and uh, that's another talk for the future. And then how much stuff is where? Again, I did this just before leaving hotel, and of course Instagram is just one of many other places, right, where you can find this, so be journey, you can see it's getting to four and a half, three and a half million posts. And I think uh, Mid Journey, which is just one of dozens and dozens of systems, I think we said recently that we have about four million registered users. So maybe there are already as many people using the system as there are as about Photoshop users, which is about 30 million people in the world. So it's really becoming, and now of course in the last few months, these tools have been built, right, into the search, into the Adobe products, into Microsoft products, into Photoshop. Photoshop came out with its own Firefly tool. Uh, so these tools are now living with proprietary platforms and becoming omnipresent. Okay, so this is four things I want to talk about, but, you know, if, it's, uh, if it becomes too slow, I will skip something. I will leave out most interesting stuff because I also want to show you my art images. Okay, so first thing, AI image synthesis as a form of media art. So this is, again, from a guide from last summer, but it's actually about DALI, but not so different. So here we teach users, right, how to structure a prompt, which is a description, right, 
you give a system, so it will predict the image you want to see, uh, and how do you specify it, a prompt, which will give you a particular type of photograph, right? And you can specify framing and film type and shoot context and, and uh, dramatic lighting, 70 for photo, et cetera, et cetera. And you're like, but where's the subject? <laughs> well, you put the subject here, right? And of course, the subject can be very long. But when I actually started collecting from Discord and looking at prompts of users, that's what I saw. So paradoxically, the description of media effects, the description of aesthetics, all these things about iPhone and 2007 and 73 and dramatic backlighting, it takes a bigger part of a prompt. So you get the strange sense <laughs> that the users of AI focus more on media effects and the amazing ability of systems to simulate different types of media, like Polaroid this and black and white that, and you know, vintage colors, than the content. And um, it's a bit anecdotal evidence, but I'm going to use it as a way to make a larger claim. So this is, again, more different media effects you can simulate, and today you can do much more. This is from last summer. And then this is, of course, you can also simulate hundreds of different effects of other two-dimensional media. You can combine them, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, more, and also, of course, artist styles. So here's the argument, or potential argument I put out for your judgment. Uh, Mid-journey stable diffusion and other AI image systems tools are only possible after enough images of artworks, illustrations, concept art, visual game art, Hollywood films, and so on have become available on the internet. And they can be used to train a very big neural network. So generative AI media is only possible today. It would not be possible 10 years because there was not enough stuff there's not enough examples of all of it on the internet. So it's a kind of post-internet effect, right? Which is very different from AI because historically AI was developing, right? In its own way, it had no connection to the internet, although it turns out already around 22 years ago, some people figure out that as opposed to giving the computer structured labeled data sets for machine learning, you can actually use unstructured web and give people text and maybe images. Of course, we're not so many images 20 years ago, uh, which contain some kind of information, right? Even though we're not labeled. And now, after 22 years, this idea gave, gave birth to this explosion of generative media. This is why I think such tools could not exist 15 years ago, because the masses of digitized cultural images and no new visual publications were not yet online. Like, your school did not have, have its catalogs online. It didn't have works of students online. The stuff did not exist. AI image generation is also you know, a form of media art. We can say it's a subset of media art um, because lots of images users create in a way use media aesthetics as its main content. Right? So what's interesting for you is not only to generate image of a beautiful girl and is that's what people do, right? Or some kind of creature from a game or some kind of object but the fact that it can be rendered in a particular effect. So in a way, it's a reflection of particular kind of post-media uh, consciousness, right? So we get terms such as Unreal 5, ray tracing, 35 millimeter photograph, etching, oil painting, volumetric lighting, uh, insane details, photorealism, establishing shot 8K, and so on. This and other aesthetic effects is often the real focus of uh, AI images. And this is another interesting anecdotal evidence. So I decided to apply right, our very basic cultural analytics methods, which is quantitative analysis of culture by uh, directing my uh, research assistant to spend a bit of time on Discord servers and to collect at random hundreds of mid-journey prompts. And then to load these prompts into this open source data visualization software uh, so this is first part of our analysis. So this is 450 prompts. And uh, you can see here uh, uh, the terms, right, automatically extracted by the software uh, in terms of their frequency. And you can see that all the top, all the top terms can describe its media statics. You can say, Lev, you actually kind of, it's a trick, right? 
because maybe people want to do different content, but everybody wants to have particular statics, and that's why these terms repeat. But I actually think with this example, even though it's not completely <laughs> you know, simple and clear, it does in a way support my argument, right? So things like detailed, style, realistic, black, black not in ethnicity, but I think black color, right? Render 4K octane, etc. right? Like this is what appears most frequently. We don't really get any content until number 18, which is eyes. Um, so it's another interesting thing. So because of these reasons, I want to claim that tools like Midjourney, or the universe created by the Midjourney tool, is about media as opposed to about imagination, or creativity, or originality, or communication. Right? So while uh, there was this promise that these tools are going to revolutionize mass communication and communication between people, let's say I want to design a house and I can't explain it to my architect, how many people have money to hire architects, uh, but anyway, so I'm going to pull out the journey and uh, make an image and then show it to the architect or something like this, but in reality, it seems like what we have so far is people fascinated with the ability of computer to simulate media effects, right? Uh, and not necessarily only Hollywood effects, also styles of different artists, although there is definitely distribution, right? What type of artists, what type of media, and more and more with this tension or, um, uh, to make photorealistic images. So in the beginning, people made more different abstract things and frescoes and cubic stuff, and now it's all more and more photorealism. You can see it here but they're still really about media effects, right? So that's kind of first argument, art image synthesis, AI synthetic media is a kind of media effect. Okay, next point, next possible argument, text is code and the art of a copy. AI image synthesis can be called the art of a copy. You endlessly, you endlessly repeat the generation process, right? You endlessly repeat the same prompt, hoping to see improvements from your first image. And you see others copying and reusing your prompts. It's also the art of copying in a different sense because users constantly refer to various artists, video games, Hollywood films, animation studios, and their prompts. Uh, so this is, I think, not actually a journey, right? This is the screenshot, I think, from Deviant Art. And I think there's lots of familiarity between Deviant Art and also. Uh, yeah, Divin Art and Mid Journey, right? And uh, you can see how people, things people do organize in a kind of, kind of genre. Some is genres are larger than others, uh, but obviously you have cosplay, right? You have right, where you dress up or make images uh, uh, honoring your favorite manga or anime, uh, fan art, and so on, right? So basically, what used to be fan fiction in the seventies, eighties, now become fan art, and fan art is probably like a huge proportion of all art being made today. Right? Um, sorry, very hard because I get blinded by the slide, sorry. Now the question is, how is this different from all traditional cultures which were about making copies of variations of smaller number of images? Or contemporary professional media uh, where a small number of original sources, such as, for example, the aesthetics of 1982 Blade Runner, is copied in hundreds of films in video games. So I went to Divine Art, right? I did a search for Blade Runner and I got like 27,000 deviations, right, by users. Or amateur culture, where for instance, we see millions of aspiring artists making millions of drawings or 3D renderings of anime characters and share them on art station Divine Art, right? So this kind of copying professional examples, uh, professional templates is already how visual culture and text culture operates today. So what is the difference between this, right, and this new generative media? Isn't it the same? It's the same, but there's one interesting difference. In text to image model, an image is generated by a kind of code, which is a text prompt. People can see others, people can see how others are typing prompts in the journey, Discord channels, and images being generated, if you can copy and immediately reuse these prompts or copy their parts. The way I was learning, and the way I think lots of people are learning, you start lurking, right? You see what people are doing, and when you say, okay, I'm going to copy this prompt, 
and you know, type it and see what I get. And maybe I will change something. Oh, now, it, now this is changing this. Or maybe I'm going to take a part. And when you, uh, you know, become more ambitious, you make your own prompt. And you say, I'm going to take this lighting from that prompt. I'm going to take this background from that prompt. So what you're doing is like a copy and paste very similar to what exploded when Photoshop became available in the mid-90s, when kind of collage and uh, putting image together on multiple levels became a kind of dominant aesthetics of kind of Photoshop era. Even later, right, it just disappeared because it was no longer interesting. And this is something which is happening here, except it's happening for text. So in a way, it's something which is in between normal language, right, which has the structure and computer coding which is a very artificial language, where you have this normal language of prompts, but it's not completely normal, but it's not really code as well, right? So people talk about prompt engineering uh, as a kind of job now, right? Um, so, um, sorry guys, it's, uh, it's hard to see. So seeing, um, okay. Oh, sorry, this is, this is coming, yes. So seeing the stream of images generated by users in any of the Discord majority channels, is more similar to how visual culture always worked and how it works today. You see the same in ArtStation, Behance, etc. Right? Endless copies with small variations or small numbers of originals, such as Blade Journey, uh, such as Blade Runner, its aesthetics repeated in endless films, TV shows, and video games. So this is not surprising, but it's important because it goes completely opposite of the kind of claims made by the designers and by the CEOs of companies and also the claims made in popular press, um, and even by, you know, by respect publications like New York Times, but anybody can create anything. Yes, anybody can create anything, except you can't create anything. So generative media, it's a very, I would say, it's a very kind of hardwired media. Yeah, using Photoshop, you can create more or less anything if you know how to use it. And using internet, right, you can more or less create any website, right? So internet doesn't dictate what website to create, right? It's a platform, right? So previous generation of media, Despite you know our, despite how much we love to criticize Facebook for everything, right? Facebook responsible for everything. Uh, Name of Facebook, no capitalism. Are by the way, I let them a secret. Uh, but it's obviously we're kind of pretty open, right? Because you know you can put, you know, right? You can put any content. Whether with your website will become popular or not, that's a different thing, right? But you can put anything online. I mean, it'll be censored if it's particular things. But but uh, but ultimately, you can put more or less. You know, everything. Here you can't, right? There are particular things which are easier to generate, there are particular things which are hard to generate. What dictates which things are which are easy, which things are hard, we'll get to it in a second, right? So in a way, after the openness of previous generations of internet, web, and desktop media, you know, Photoshop, I um, mean Maya, <laughs> After Effects, and so on, this is really something else, right? You have a room with thousands of assistants, very brilliant, but very stubborn. Right? And very often, they put their own latent message, and when you discover later, oh my God, that's not what I wanted to say. And we'll talk about it in a second. So, um, okay, this is, okay, here we go. Okay, so next, um, so next very short sections. Um, image and text relationship, revisiting Roland Barthes. We can't do without him. Uh, so for decades, we assumed that describing an image by words, it was limiting. Mm -hmm. That was kind of modernist idea. That's why so many modernist paintings and graphics are called untitled, right? Because to put a word description was limiting. So the idea was with different uh, media, different arts, would we'll discover own languages, and the languages would not be narrative. We would get away from theatricality, from, from stories. Actually, if you ask me, Le, what is your three most hated words? Most hated words. Let's see, okay. One is about dealing with issues. Second, second is like identity because I don't have one, and uh, and and the third one, and the third one is uh, storytelling. When I hear about storytelling, I just want to kill everybody with my Kalashnikov, right? <laughs> you know, uh, after 20th century abstraction, what what is this crap, right? Anyway, so um, so for example, one of the key goals of visual modernism was to get uh, was to get into the story by having instead paintings explore their own visual languages. And this is why Untitled became a very common line for modern artworks. Refusing semantic labels, it may limit what a viewer would see in the image. And the same idea would appear in a kind of intellectual discourse about mass media. So for example, oh, we'll get here. <laughs> Roland Barthes suggested that newspaper texts 
uh, newspaper text captions uh, fixes the meaning of a newspaper photograph, limiting its potential ambiguity. Right? So that was the idea of Roland Barthes, which is later became a popular part of uh, media studies, communication studies, with the image is potentially ambiguous, a very modernist idea. Uh, but it's true when you look at different images of war, for example, today, without a label, it's hard to say what we're supposed to mean or what we represent. Right? Is it Ukrainian tank, Russian tank, and what's going on, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, but what happens now? So I think what happens with, with generative media is something very interesting, right? Because I'm basically kind of using, sorry, a bit out of, I'm using, right, the same prompt to make images. And when I roll the same prompt over and over, I get more images. So from the same prompt, I can make unlimited number of images. And these images would be all a bit different. So what happens here is that when I use AI tools, my experience is that is that the tools amplify, we amplify my short phrase prompt, generating nuances, details, atmospheres, meanings, associations, and moods you didn't specify. And often would never imagine. So there's this kind of, um, so it's a bit out of, um, no, this was, this was, okay, you're wondering what the slide, this was to illustrate this idea that uh, culture was always about copying, right? So, you know, Peter, Peter Bruegel, for example, the elder, so he made 40 or 50 paintings. I mean, his family already, right, during his lifetime, you know, was making copies of his paintings, and the copy was understood, right, as a very legitimate part of culture. You know, and uh, some copies were better, some are worse, some are unique. So the reason you go to a museum today, you get a completely distorted picture of our history, because our history is a big lie. That's a whole other lecture. Uh, I can explain, but one reason it's a lie, it's a kind of modernist projection onto our history, right? We only show unique. Here's this Picasso, here's this Broglie, but in reality, Picasso, Broglie, everybody else would copy themselves endlessly, not only their children and their relatives, right? So like this one painting with 160 copies. So the idea, the culture was always about copies of a few templates, it's just the copy process, how many copies, <laughs> Uh, what function is the original, what is worth is changing, right? But the copy process did not change. But here, uh, something else, right? So that's like it's one of these websites which collects millions of AI images, and you can search for them. Um, and uh, for example, uh, so here's, right, here's a prompt. Here are the images, and then you can say explore the style, and then uh, you can say, right, so here's all the other images that found, uh, which are kind of share the same prompt. So you can see how the same prompt or the same terms in the prompt give rise to a very big visual universe. So, uh, and what's also interesting, right? So this is all the images, let's say, generated, right? From this prompt by different users. And when you think about the image, each image has deta infinite details, right? There are textures, there are compositions, there are particular kind of fractal configuration of spaces, there are shadows which are not in the prompt, right? So, you know, there is this, um, I think, um, common, right, understanding that the text limits the image, but in this case, yes, the text limits the image, except the text becomes generative, right? The text liberates all these images out of, like, this latent existence, and uh, the AI adds all these details which you never specified. So it kind of gives you more than what you wanted, and this is wonderful, and that's why people like it so much, because it's a very magical feeling, except what it gives you is often something which is more typical, stereotypical, common, because that's what it learns. Anyway, let me show you this one example. So this was, I did very early, I think in September of last year. I used Midjourney, I kind of made this image, you know, which was represented, I think, what Midjourney could do at the time. A kind of very typical modernist still life. Actually, I was trying to do Morandi, but didn't succeed, but it doesn't matter. And when I keep like running the same prompt, and it made you know, more images, and each image was really nice, right? Aesthetically, compositionally, even more, even this is four by four, eventually I made 128, right? From the same prompt, right? So that was, I think, interesting idea how, in a way, Roland Barthes, right? And the modernist idea becomes reversed, right? So, <laughs> so the same text can lead to lots and lots of different images. Um, I wanted to talk about this, and I guess I will sacrifice maybe my, um, my artworks, but that's very important. Okay, so, um, so I kept mentioning a few times, right, in my talk, 
with this new generation of tools, this new generation of media, uh, right? We used to think that you know Facebook and Instagram and the search engine, the web, we kind of right, very biased and this and that. But this thing is much more biased, right? So you think about right. So it's a tool which anybody can use to communicate, right? Your grandmother can tell something visually to a grandson, and it should have some kind of neutral style. But what is a neutral style? So the CEO of Midjourney talks about a house style. Every time we release a new version, they'll be like, well, what's going to be our house style? He said, well, we can't tell you. But really, well, it's going to be something which is orange and blue and kind of, orange and blue, of course, is the typical colors used in Hollywood, right, to colorize films. So that's already something very biased or very opinionated. So if you want to figure out, right, what's going on and really prove what I'm saying, go to Midjourney, type a sphere. Is this neutral? Right. This is Baroque, Rococo, Gaudi, Picasso, Hollywood, Frank Gehry, uh, I don't know, uh, Microsoft, right? It's like nothing but a sphere, right? So what happens is that you can, right, you can work very hard if you know about history of art and have like lots of art experience. And I've been, I've been right, I, I was trained in art, started 50 years ago and, and doing art all my life and teaching art. I can kind of force it to do something else something gray, depressing, melancholic, kind of post-Soviet, Tarkovsky, but it takes lots of work. <laughs> and even though most Tarkovsky depressed images, they still may be kind of cheerful, right? And you can see why. So if you ask me, uh, this is maybe, from my point of view, from a point of view of somebody who's really concerned about aesthetic diversity and aesthetic and cultural variability, this is maybe the most dangerous thing, and I think we should like, really talk more about it because it's not discussed enough, that the systems, way with this GPT, right, which learned, which learned from trillions of web pages. GPT already read 70% of all web pages and all the books. And this thing already learned from 800 million images. So theoretically, it should lead us to great diversity, right? You know, you can do this, and I can do that, and your student can do this, and your grandmother can do that, and it should be an explosion of diversity. But instead, we get something like this, very particular, and something like this crops into di different things. So the way the uh, machine learning works, and that's a paradigm today, and I'm not sure you can do it differently, because the same limitation, the same basic issue, is common to all data science going back to statistics in the 18th century. The statistics emerges in the 18th century is the discipline which deals with patterns. Right. What is pattern? Well, it's aggregation of separate data points, right? So you visualize tra you know, trade relation between different European countries by bar charts, but uh, you no longer see a particular person trading to a particular person. I mean, it all gets aggregated, right? Uh, if you're doing a scatter plot, sorry, this is going to be like a bit like a 50 second excursion into mathematics, but you guys should know it by now if you came to my lecture. Like you're making scatter plot, right? And when you say, oh, there's a cluster here, there's another cluster here, and what are these points? The outliers, I'm going to remove them, right? So both statistics, and then it's contemporary instantiation we call data science, and AI are kind of designed to deal with typical, which is basically means common, frequent, and not, right, and not, and kind of, and we don't know how, how well to do with something which is unique. So that's why, you know, when I try to do my things, which are not good or bad, but they're just different, right? I'm encountering you know, lots and lots of issues. And maybe what I'll do is just uh, use, can I use five more, po five more minutes, right? And then we'll talk about, yeah, I'll show you some examples. And there are lots of, of course, ways to, for me to present my artworks. But for the sake of lecture, I will sacrifice the artist to live, you know, the lecture. <laughs> and I will use them a bit as a way to illustrate this issue how I was trying to deal with it, right? So first of all, just to show you how it started, right? So as I told you, I started learning art in the age of 12. And then, you know, this is the kind of things I would do when I was 18, it's a portrait of my mother, uh, ink on paper. And you see where's a kind of stem, because when we're immigrating from Soviet Union in 1981, I decided I would take some of my artworks. And uh, unfortunately, there was no close up of a stem. And I had to take them to, like Ministry of Culture, and was this very well-dressed 
and communism people dress so well because there's nothing else to do, right? I mean, you know, communism created the most materialistic society, right? It was like Milan. Yeah, a very well dressed art historian, and she looked at all my artworks. Even she stamped all the artworks I could take, and with some of them I couldn't take. Anyway, so, so this is how I started, right? Uh, with kind of modernism, you know, uh, my art teacher told me that, you know, Morandi was, you know, best artist of all time. Uh, this is actually something more recent from a few years ago. Just show you examples. Uh, yeah, this is mid 80s, etc., etc. Uh, maybe uh, things like this, for example, right? Okay, so then uh, I said, okay, this is the kind of things, you know, I used to do. Can I get back to this kind of sensibility? Can I get back to the left? Uh, before he learned about postmodernism, before he went to graduate school, before he got his PhD, before he got invited to Barcelona, can I kind of get back to it uh, with AI, right? Can I play Levy artist who is 23? And uh, here's what happened. Sorry, I have, to, I have to make the strange dance because you know, the screen is very small and my eyes are not getting any better. So, okay, so here's what we got, right? Um, so, so this is, I think, from last fall. This is actually a stable diffusion, which has a different default language, right? When we journey, but it still has something else, right? And I said, uh, maybe I want to make these imaginary projects kind of imagining my fellow Russian students in high school when I was studying in 1976, 1977, and I got something like this. And, you know, I had this uh, problems, right, with anatomy, you know, about hand problem, but there's also, like, eye problem. So I can basically, I basically added lots of fog in my prompt, and then I added more fog in Lightroom, and I got something like this, and people like it. It was shown in a few exhibitions, and I was, like, so, so happy, because I said, yeah, I don't think my school children, my sort of fellow school children look like this, but there's something very, right, Tarkovsky, kind of stalker, uh, you know, long lines, uh, communal apartments, uh, kind of late communism, you know, Brezhnev nostalgia. It, it really captures some DNA, right? And now I look at this, I'm like, what's going on? Are these really normal people? Or, I, or is it like a stage? It's like a theater stage, right? It's like my dream, my memory being played by, by actors, by the strange artificial beings, right? And everybody is a character, everybody is too perfect. And what is the status of memory? And what will happen when not only, you know, city of Barcelona and not only Magbar, but individuals like us will start using the tools that's already happening in China to recreate our memories, right? You say, oh, this is, you know, you know, oh, you know, this is how your bedroom looked when you were five, right? Even the bedroom looks like this Hollywood thing, right? Uh, so you can see that when we talk about biases or default languages, we have to be subtle, right? Because bias doesn't simply mean everything looks photorealistic. Bias doesn't simply mean that there are more female than male, or everybody is white. That's also true. But bias or uh, this kind of commonality, you know, this fatricality, right? The bias can show up in very different ways, and in a very subtle ways, in a ways which is almost, for me, hard to put into a language, right? So this is both wonderful and completely terrifying, right? Uh, and Maybe that's how it looked in Moscow in 1976. I don't know, because there were no photographs, because we didn't have cameras. Like for my whole life in Russia, I have like five photographs, because the cameras were not very common, right? Uh, and of course, there were not so many photographs of this period on the internet, so yeah, I can't learn from them. So what is this, right? Is this my life? Is this my history? Is this my unconscious? I showed it to my psychotherapist, who is brilliant. She said, I don't know, right? But that's interesting. So she tried to analyze this, right? So let me show you some more examples. Uh, so then I said, okay, maybe, what about I try to imagine like a scene in a bus, right? Something which I liked a lot as a child, you know, people on the bus. And this is Mid Journey version, I think, four. And at first I was so happy. And I spent hours in Photoshop, you know, fine tuning this and putting more blue, et cetera. And really saying, look, I can do this, and look, I can show off my drawing skills. And now I'm wondering, it's like, is this a Hollywood film of Russia? Is it Eisenstein film? Is it like some kind of documentary? Like, so what is this representation, right? What is its status? But me and some of you may still wonder, but people who are young in the room may no longer wonder, may no longer wonder because we grew up on Instagram where everything is exaggerated, everything is Photoshop, everything is theatrical, right? And uh, I don't want to be dogmatic, right? I don't want to say it was better before my journey. 
I don't want to say it was better than Midjourney version 2. I don't want to be like old fart, but something is going on. And trust me, you know, I'm good with predicting this idea of uh, future, the synthetic memories, uh, which will become more and more common and um, will become important, right? So I'll just, sh I'll just finish by showing you a few of these things and leave you, you know, to reflect on them. Uh, and of course, when I, when I find a few photographs which were published at the time from a period by foreign, and of course, by foreign journalists who were also all photographing, you know, Red Square anyway, it doesn't look like this at all, but it captures something, right? It captures the mood. Um, so this was another project, right? So again, my childhood, as I mentioned, by majority. So I said, people are sleepy, people are tired in the subway because they're going to work. But Midjourney made everybody sleeping. You know? um, and, uh, okay, and then let's see a bit more, right? And then this one, uh, okay, no this, no, this is too complicated. Okay, just a second. Okay, and then I also made things which were you know, more political because I was like, like many other people, like my fellow friends, my fellow intellectuals, artists, curators, you know, my couple of them are in this room, my very dear friends, you know, even though like, I immigrated 42 years ago, right? So I had my trauma, but it was like a long time ago. So now I'm enjoying the fact that I left Russia, right? 40 years before Putin. Um, but I was also very much affected by war. So I started to imagine things. And I thought, well, maybe that's what the war will continue and who knows what will happen. So I called the series Russia after the long war. And I noticed that every time I put Russia into a prompt, the Red Square comes out and churches came out. I tried to get rid of it. No, maybe I should like just go with it, right? And that's what I've done, right? So this idea is like a various right, kind of Soviet style, uh, you know, communal housing and the old church, which is like the old church in Red Square. And I left it where, right? Uh, I left it where. Uh, and then this looks like something Wild West. Right? <laughs> so uh, what is the status of these new memories? And this is one topic which I think I want to finish off, right? Uh, this uh, very complex issues, right? What happens when AI learns from billions or trillions of artifacts? And, uh, right? and, it, and when you ask it to render a sphere, and it makes you a theatrical kind of Frangeri sphere, as opposed to some kind of Bauhaus sphere, <laughs> and how it, this shows up in a very subtle and not very clear way. And what is the language we need to develop? We need to develop a critical language to talk about this kind of biases. But we can't, we can't call everything biased because it's simplistic and idiotic, right? So we need to talk about something else. I don't know, but I think I want to raise these issues. And let me just show you a few other things. And we'll see. Okay, so this one is about, oh yeah. So this was another attempt, right? This early attempt at my Russian kind of fellow students. This is journey, I think, version three. So again, the faces are very distorted, but I like this image more, right? Because in a way, it's like modern art, right? Things are not as realistic, things are not as precise, and you can like, imagine more, you can feel the information, and uh, maybe the bias is less present, or maybe the bias is less visible, and uh, this is the images which were used, right, by the, your wonderful school in the social media, and maybe I'll just show you and then I was also trying to think about the war and how I felt, and do I even have a, do I even have a right to feel bad because I'm like in safety of New York and my job? And I felt frozen, right? And uh, you know, AI is very good at generating atmospheres, but I was frozen images still too lush, too wonderful, too pretty. Uh, I don't know, right? So I'm both fascinated by them and I'm terrified by them. Shall I show them as my art? Shall I show them as only experiments? I don't know, right? So I just put it for your judgments. And finally, let's just say we end here. Oh, okay, and then finally, of course, I said, okay, I'll make something pretty. People are going to like it. I get lots of likes. So we combine Malevich and Borsch and we get something like this and it's very nice, but it's not mine, right? This is not me. This is really me journey speaking. And, um, and then you also made this. And uh, uh, which is again not me, but it's also strange and it's also a bit relevant because my prompt was, and I will leave it here, my prompt was a city in Siberia 
designed by progressive architects in Russia in 1965 and rendered by Bosch. And that's what you get. And uh, so I'm sorry for my strange dance, but again, I'm completely out of practice. My parachute never opened, and I was kind of a bit blinded by the lights, and this is too small. And uh, not so many people left. Uh, I think more than 20% stayed. Just joking. So I hope you guys still have questions, and if you want to continue, bar and tapas, uh, you know, we can stay until next month. I'm because still until 19th. But I'm staying here, and it's all on me. Um, so, uh, and of course, you can reach out on social media. So ultimately, I'm trying to figure out, right? Lev, after you know, spending 30 years and publishing 180 articles and 15 books and 700 lectures, can you actually do something which is easy for you, which is make art, even if it's bad art? This business is ultimately so much easier to do for me when I write with articles and try to make these arguments. And do I have a right? Because we're always artists in Russia, in Belarus, in Ukraine, you know, who lost everything. Do I have a right to kind of put my work in front of curators? I don't know. But uh, my, my therapist said yes, <laughs> but I'm not fully convinced. But uh, ultimately, what I want to say is I will do it unless you tell me to shut up, because ultimately what matters to me, and that's why I never became like a normal art, uh, for, partly because I was afraid of art world, because I thought I can't really schmooze, but turns out I can schmooze very well uh, with academics, is that I'm interested in communication, right? I'm interested in discussion. So the reason I put my images and my text online is to simulate discussions. So as long as I can do things, it can be engravings, it can be architecture, it can be like performances where I'm good to undress, don't worry, I'm just joking, right? Whatever I do to simulate communication, simulate thinking, I will do it. And uh, I promised in the beginning to tell you not to be afraid. So don't be afraid of AI because it's a fiction, but what we should be really afraid about is when you post something online and everybody likes it, and there is no discussion anymore because people are afraid to disagree. And you notice how it's been, that's what we have to be afraid of. What we have to be afraid of is these strange biases which show up in very subtle ways, where suddenly you just want a very stoic, very sad, very Tarkovsky-like sphere. Instead, you get this happy kind of tapas, Barcelona, like let all the tourists come, design hotel sphere, right? So what we have to be afraid of is complacency. We have to be afraid of top 10 and top 100, we have to be afraid of statistics uh, because statistics never learn to deal with uniqueness. And who is Picasso? It's outlier. Who is, the, who is, uh, uh, who is Gaudi's outlier, right? So I want to kind of finish with lecture, invitation to you know, some tapas. Here's the outliers uh, and um, how we can use these tools because we have to use them, but how we can teach these tools uh, to help us to be more unique and to uh, not and to read the sphere in a boring, bad way. So here's to badness. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I have no idea what happened last hour, but thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah. Well. Uh, hello, thank you so much for the talk. I'll say it in English, since it's in English. Uh, hi. Uh, so, um, when you make an artwork... Uh, sorry, I'm just like exploring with all the space here. I'm sorry <laughs> I didn't make it here. Sorry. Okay, yes. Okay. Yeah. When you make an artwork, it's not like a so rational process, no? There's kind of like, there's a moment when you take a photography, when you're painting, there's a moment that it's not mechanical. And that's why they say artists are conveyors of, uh, you know, a more mystical world or are in contact with some other forces and they're channels of this art. Uh, I agree this is phenomenal and it's a great tool for working, for researching. I was talking with some scientists and says that is revolutioni uh, revolutionizing uh, science because you can, you know, research everywhere. But um, everything that you showed, in a way, it's very kind of Facebook, Instagram, like, it's a lot of image, kind of, but I feel like making this art. Is, this is not Instagram. No, 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 no I'm not. You're going to find this on Instagram. No, I'm not saying. I mean, I'm maybe this one this. you'll find. No, no, but, but you know, I'm not saying yeah, this yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah. Not so. In fact, in fact, you know, like I. What wish, I say yeah. is like yeah, art yeah. is like an invisible thing that is a human thing connected with reality, and this, as much as is a tool, I wonder. I I don't think it can. Cr it you can it can be a help to create art, but. Uh, 
and I'm very old school, you know. I love Marshall McLuhan. I think he would love all this. But uh, I, I don't think this, and it's a, we said we agreed to disagree, I don't think uh, by saying, yeah, I want a green dog or whatever, like it's so far away from the process of creativity, I think. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, uh, let me sketch very briefly the answer, and it's going to be a bit... It's going to be a bit black and white, but when the city of you know, Velasquez and Zurbaran and uh, you know, things are very black and things are very hard shadows. Okay. So creativity and art and artists were concepts that did not exist until the romantic period. So the paradox of human history is human created the best possible art and best possible creativity without ever having this concept. Since we invented this concept, things got worse progressively. Art is a mechanical process, you know, right? I mean, uh, artists, art, people who call themselves artists are just random people who got to art school. We have no skills, we have no knowledge. I mean, people who were crafts people before, right, had something. Of course, we're not respected in ancient Greece because we were just copying, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, there's nothing special, creative around art. It's a mechanical process, people copy things. And there is no big difference between what happens in the head of even very talented artist, architect, and, and Majorni, right? I'm exposed to things around, around, you know, around uh, uh, things you know, when I see around me, when I go to museums, when I travel, and when I start doing something and the stereotypes come out, and that's what happens exactly what AI does, right? So it's kind of different, except AI learned three million, three million things, three trillion things. So, you know, so of course, in reality, AI is way more creative, way more artistic, it's way smarter, we just don't know how to use it, right? We give it idiotic prompts, so it's our fault. Uh, so uh, I can also, what I'm saying is like I respect you, but I can also make a completely different argument. And if you look at the art of Renaissance, yeah, the artist makes a contract. I'm going to paint, you know, this and that, Madonna. I'm going to use so much cadmium, so much ochre. It was a completely design project, right? It was like designing a car, you know, for Fiat. You know, let's get rid of this idea of creativity. The reason our society likes this idea of art and creativity is that we, we think with artists. I uh, have this free life, we travel around, we fly to Biennale. Uh, in reality, of course, as we know, right, artists are prisoners of their galleries, their contracts, their styles, their brands. Uh, so it's a great illusion. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that if our society paid less attention to art and more attention to medicine, science, I don't know, uh, and uh, use experience design and AI, things will be only better, right? So I'm kind of complete opposite. But I'm your old fashioned, I'm also old fashioned, but a bit more old fashioned, new fashioned, right? Yeah, but you know, when you use pen, right? That's also technology. That was new media at some point. What's the difference, right? Anyway, next. <laughs> yeah. I have a... Lev, I have a question for you. Yeah, um, please. Have you seen Republicans yet? Have I seen what, sorry? It's uh, my favorite mashup of RuPaul Drag Race with American Republicans. Oh. Uh, to okay. basically make commentary on all the trans rights laws that are being violated in the United States. And it's a very powerful way. I think, for me, mm -hmm. it was the first time I saw something done in artificial intelligence that became very popular. It's maybe three or four days old now. Yes. Where I went, wow, this is political commentary yes. in a very powerful way. Exactly what artificial intelligence does really well because I agree with you with when you were mentioning how you were hanging out on mid journey last year Watching what people were creating. I think a lot of us did that and it was kind of sad actually what was being made There were a lot of like Game of Thrones, you know yeah, 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 fan yeah. Sure, art sure, and things sure. like that. Sure. So I think the um, the interesting thing is when you start to think about bringing two things together that are maybe very disparate in the normal world, and now someone with a thought can just create very strong political commentary, which before would have maybe been done in a tweet, right? Yes. But now we have a visual representation of that. And I think I'm very excited mm -hmm. about particularly that level of what a lot of designers do, which is bring two things together that don't really live together, and they create a new meaning out of those things, right? Mm -hmm. And not just the, the styles. So my question for you is, um, you've obviously been working in this field a very long time. What is your prediction for what we will really be doing visually with arti artificial intelligence that we can't yet do now with any other media that we have? Yes, sure, nothing special. 
that's a great answer. No, no, that's a great answer. It's a prediction. Look, look, look. Guys, okay. By the way, you know, by the way, here's what I'm waiting for, right? So this is the drawing I made. I think as soon as I left Russia, so trying to imagine the world with this kind of late communism as this kind of theater play, like a bit surreal, but soft surrealism. And now every month I'm trying to get the eye to continue with drawing. So that's what happens, right? You know, it completely fails, right? Now all I'm asking to do, because of course it doesn't understand the meaning, so it makes ambiguity, but it's ambiguity which is not interesting. My ambiguity is interesting, I think. This ambiguity is not interesting. Uh, but when I said maybe you can put like a background, I raised background and said maybe you can put clouds by Rembrandt and now it works very well. But I feel very, very, you know, right, dishonest putting clouds by Rembrandt. Anyway, so I'm really interested actually in questions. I'm like 1970s person, right? I'm interested in that kind of art. Well, look, we had this, um, we had this um, um, era, we had this kind of visual revolution in, in, in uh, communication, right? 1870, 1970. Right? You know, every image which you can make was made. So you can make them like a bit more, like a bit variations, like fractal image, but it's not so different, right? So it's not possible, <laughs> not possible to make new images because all the images were made. I mean, you can make variations with and that. So I think the only, I think one possible future for art design communication would be some kind of three-dimensional holographic things, which as you see in lots of movies, right? Some kind of three-dimensional interface. But when this interface is, A, it's going to be like Henry Moore, right? Or it's going to be like a kind of photorealistic, except it's going to be 3D realistic, right? Because again, after 70, after 100 years of modernism, what else you can do? And you know, you're great, the great local, right? You know, Andre, right? Andre, um, always forget his name, right? The, the guy, the kind of inventor of molecular cuisine, right? Well, yeah, you know, you know what he said? Smart guy, he said, look, I don't, okay, I, I, I wanted to become artist, but everything, but we had this amazing periods of innovation in art. 1870, 1970, everything was done. So I went into food because food modernism just starts. Yeah, so art, it's, uh, you can make nice things, you can make subtle things, I mean, you can make installations, but you can't make anything genuinely new. I mean, you can't, because it's, it's like, it, it's done, right? You can make new architecture, right? You know, but why people with over trillions of dollars can't make a single, a single meter, which is as interesting as Gaudi, right? I mean, we get Zaha Hadid, we get, you know, we get uh, Frank Gehry, and it's like, it's like primitive, right? So we have all the technologies, but we can't, we can't do it because maybe you don't have religious faith, right? Maybe that's why. Uh, or we're not 20th century artists who were fighting against religion, but once religion died, and once the fight against religion was finished, maybe, maybe we can't because we live in mechanical civilization. So my, you know, the answer is that you, know, you can do little things, communication, but you can't do anything fundamental because the innovative period in art and humanities is finished, right? Now there's innovative periods in biology or space travel or, I don't know, or propaganda, right? Or like, you know, making 20th century Cold War but only better, right? I'm joking, right? But you can't make, you can't make innovation art and, and that's not important, right? Art was about faith, art was about experience. I mean, nobody, nobody had this idea in 14th century, 17th century, let's make new art, let's be creative. I mean, there's only one creator, God, right? And the fact that humans made all this amazing stuff, it can happen by accident, right? So the moment you're asking, can we make new art with AI, you already completely failed. I don't mean you personally, but you, you follow my logic, right? It's a kind of wrong, it's a question which shows how wrong we are, you know? Anyway, that's it. But I'm sure what you're, what you're talking about, sorry, I haven't seen it. I, you know, I can never go online or I can enjoy, you know, enjoy, enjoy you know, walking around Barcelona. I can go online like next because that's what I do. I didn't see it, but I'm sure it can do you know, well, very particular things. Uh, but, okay, so sorry, I hope it's <laughs> made my point, right? But you can argue with me, right? <laughs> so we're like, we're like on Facebook, right? Everybody's like, okay, like I tell you, like, you're completely wrong, everybody's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you don't tell me I'm completely wrong, then I don't pay for drinks, only if you tell me I'm completely wrong. <laughs> okay, no, but I'm sorry, I haven't seen it, but maybe you can send me the link and I'll be happy to look at this, yeah. Okay. Yeah, anyway. Hi, Lev. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, hello. Yeah. What are um. your thoughts on the use of small data as a counterposition to the use of big data and still having algorithms able to learn from few points, not necessarily these right. 
so we can keep the mean of the statistical processes? Yes. Well, so the way I understand it, and you know, I kind of chose, I decided, you know, it, I decided, you know, that, um, uh, I mean, it may sound very strange, but uh, I do strange things. I just want to show you something if I can, if I can open it, sorry, just a moment. I decided that, because now everybody is getting into AI, uh, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm working on now, right? Every day I open my iPad and I'm making like versions of this cube, right? I'm basically learning how to draw. And it looks like something from 1950 and I love it, right? Uh, <laughs> so that's my small data, right? Um, so, um, so the way I understand, so I chose not to spend time, right, getting technically into the neural networks, but my understanding, right, is that uh, people take, right, already pre-trained networks so before it was ImageNet, uh, and then now it's like stable diffusion, right? And then you can fine tune it on a small data set of about 40, 50, 60 images, and you get something interesting, but the shadow, right? The shadow of this big data is still there, right? Uh, and that's what I'm trying to get at, right? Is that this, um, what the network learned, right? This kind of collective unconscious, right? This collective thing in trillions and trillions of uh, connections embodied inside it, right? Does it still show? Does it still show its ugly face, or can we kind of submerge it, right, uh, by putting 40, 50 images on top of it, right? So I don't know. I don't know, right? But I don't. I don't, I don't have. I don't have an answer, right? Uh, and uh, as far as learning, right? As far as learning from you know small data from scratch, yeah. I mean, yeah. Of course, you can learn from this, because on purpose, these images are very similar to each other, right? And uh, but. Uh, I'm doing it on purpose, right? But then let's say that's another image I made, right? I was trying to remember how to draw when I made something like this and when I made something like this, right? You can't learn this because every image is a bit different, right? So it kind of depends, right? It kind of depends. But uh, the last thing I want to say is that also very interesting about this AI generative media is that before we think of artists, architect, designer, right, filmmakers, you have a unique artistic language. And even if I wanted to make work in lots of different styles, there were very, very few people who were able to do it, right? But with uh, generative media, there's a certain separation between, between the content and the style, right? So I can take one day, right, I can make these kind of images, the next day I can make these kind of images, the next day I can make these kind of images, and uh, I'm not attached to the styles because I just specify, okay, you know, Malevich or, um, Van Gogh or Bosch or Photograph, et cetera, et cetera. And that's an interesting question, right? So let's say now I'm going to make my art portfolio, right? And who am I, right? Uh, you can say, well, if it doesn't matter anymore, right? It doesn't matter what the styles are, you know, what, uh, what is maybe common to your images as a particular set of ideas, but maybe I don't have a set of ideas. Maybe every day I want to explore something different. So what before was kind of almost physically, cognitively impossible, now it becomes completely normal. So what does this mean for the identity of designers, architects, chefs, right? Imagine you have this material AI, right? Where every day you can make meal or make dresses or make flower arrangements, you know, or design cars in a totally different styles. In fact, I can design different things. I can have different ideas every day, but it's one person because the AI enables it. That's, I think, to me, is one of the key questions, right? Uh, and some people say, Lev, yeah, but you're actually mistaking more and more contemporary artists. We don't have one style. We work across media. Today, do installation. Today, do more. But these tools do make it, I think, easier for me to change, right? I can occupy positions of a million different artists, right? And every 10 minutes, I can change. So who am I as an artist? What is my identity? Uh, that's an interesting question, right? And that's a big one. So. Um, so I become big data, right? I become big data, right? Uh, I mean, Picasso made, right, 10,000 paintings, most are bad ones, but 5% are good ones. But I can make, right, all, me and my friends, we make 10,000 images in a few months, and we're all different, right? And they're as good as the good art of the 18th century, because that's what technology does. Technology makes things trivial, right? I mean, Instagram is full of good photography, which is good as top photography of the 20th century, not the best ones, but pretty good ones, like 95%. So that's a big question. Yeah. So, you know.
Yes, please. I think mm -hmm. we're supposed to be aligned first. Sorry, <laughs> can I? <laughs> yes. Um, so you you touched upon this already, um, but I think this is a big question as well as we've already lived in oversaturated world, and especially in a um, well. When that's it comes what we think now, but ten years from now, it will be like nothing. It was nothing, mm -hmm. right? Anyway, yes. And uh, so the question is as well, and there were so many already words of judgment uh, about particular styles and aesthetics being brought up here. So that's the question is, what about the aesthetics? And what this possibility in like millions of hands does to, and part of this as well, design uh, as a language and as a um, tool. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, I was like, actually, I'm sorry, what is this? Okay, sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, sorry. So, uh, so the question is... Uh, sorry, sorry, my fault, yeah. I will start with, the <laughs> again, uh, so we, at, um, we attach so many uh, words of already in this conversation as well, of judgment regarding styles and art and aesthetics. And yeah. so the question is now, this tool uh, allows to uh, those aesthetics go uh, into the wild. And so how will that impact? How, what is your prediction? How will that impact the aesthetic world that we now uh, share? Like every tool brings its own aesthetics. Like we have inst you know, Instagram aesthetics, Pinterest uh, yes. brought its own. Sure. So how uh, do you think this yes, will yes. impact? Well, so yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That's actually a more, I think, more close to what I was talking about. Um, so I think in general, right? Um, uh, okay, so there are right. There are a few different possible answers. One is that we live in this world of heterogeneity, right? This kind of postmodern world where everything goes, but it's not quite true, right? So you know, today we have K-pop influence, and K-pop is very particular aesthetics, which has nothing to do with Korean aesthetics because I spent half my time in Korea. I can tell you, yeah. I mean, in the 80s we had Japan, and when we had Bauhaus and wallpaper magazine, right? So, so there are particular themes which become more important than other things become, right, like, kind of like, not relevant, right? In fact, the most, the most heterogeneous postmodern period was the 19th century when we had historicism and eclecticism and neo-Gothic, right? And, you know, and uh, Gaudi is just one expression of it, right? That was actually more variety than now. Now it's like, you know, we're like in Bauhaus boxes, right? Just, with, just painted with different materials, right? Uh, so, um, or Zaha Hadid boxes, which is like not so different, right? So, okay, so, uh, so there are definitely some things which emerge, and other things are not. Now, why it happens, there are, right? there are different, I mean, different uh, theories, right? It's very hard to say. Uh, so what will come after K-pop, right? Neo-Gothic, we don't know. So I think that the actual tools, so to speak, they play some role in this, but not more than 20, 30%. You know, uh, and uh, and then and then the next thing, right? And actually, I can I can make this point, uh, which is something I thought about before we talk, and I want to develop it so I can remember it because I think it's a good point. Well, so um, I think if we look at tools or media or materials, right, some have like stronger effect on what you're doing, and some are not, right? So if you draw like line, if you draw with some stencil or some other material on a flat surface. I mean, obviously, pencil gives you more freedom. Right? If I'm doing like engraving, right? You know, so I can't do like very fine right, hatching. I can't do very thin lines, right? If I'm doing like lithography, right? If I'm building a building from bricks versus something else, so, right, et cetera. So, so I think what's interesting is that, so there's this idea, right, which we uh, wrongly <laughs> associate with McLuhan. And when a new medium emerges, it first imitates old media, and eventually a new original aesthetics, identity, right, thing comes out. Completely wrong idea, uh, in a way. Um, so, so in fact, when Photoshop, like when Photoshop and this generation of aesthetic tools, right, first appears in the early 90s, uh, with this Photoshop collage aesthetics which appears, which is actually different from what we had before. Because the 20th century collage, we, we couldn't have lots of transparency, right? So the 1920s, 1930s photo collage, and 1990s collage was very different. But as Photoshop matures, as the resolution of monitors become bigger as RAM, 
People now use Photoshop to do just about everything. There is no Photoshop aesthetics anymore, right? I think with Instagram, it's actually a bit similar, right? So Instagram in 2013 was more distinct than Instagram today. Uh, so in a way, if you think about these examples, what happens is opposite. So today we're looking, right, we're looking at this journey and there are these terrifying kind of male, most imagination, and all these kind of beauties and all these medieval characters, and maybe in two years it will become much more, much more variety. So there's an interesting idea here. I know I just thought about it before we talk, so I'm just trying to think about it more. But as the tools develop, as computational environment develops, the tools become less specific, right? Uh, we lose their, their kind of aesthetic, uh, content, semantic specificity. Um, and anyway, it's an interesting idea just because it's different, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's completely wrong. So, um, uh, so I think that um, ultimately, I think the key question to me, right? It's not, are we going to have new influence from country X? Like we had Japan in the 80s, you know, in Korea in 2010s, and uh, France in 1900. But what is going to be the shape of variability and diversity, right? In other words, are, are certain ideas, certain images, certain aesthetics will become dominant? You know, the way now, like you teach a class, right? And unless you have brilliant students, if you teach normal class, everybody you go, to, okay, I'm going to work about environment. I'm going to work about X. So people don't think, right? We just kind of like repeat memes, which are in the culture, right? Uh, so again, we live in this paradoxical time where what I do for fun is I read Wikipedia, right? Uh, you know, and the scientists are talking about that there's 100 million species in this planet. And all the knowledge, all the knowledge of thousands of years is available to us, and yet you go into any art gallery, right? You, you open any magazine, unless it's a very academic one, it's the same five topics, the same five interpretations, right? I mean, people who finished high school 100 years ago were way more educated and could write much better than most PhDs today, right? So that's a problem, right? Is that we have technical means to have diversity, variability, millions of clusters, and yet everybody, like, what do you get when you travel, right? You get bio biodegradable, uh, you know, avocado toast, and right? In other words, I think there's a feeling, which I have at least, that in the last 30 years, is the world globalized and became more connected technically, um, and people never live so well, right? I mean, think about how people live 100 years ago, right? And today, today, like, normal person lives like a king from 100 years ago, right? So materially, we live very well, right? Only idiots can believe in crises, who read media. But culturally, the globalization, in a funny way, led not to this flourishing of diversity, but to uh, a kind of power curve, right? Where 99% of attention goes to the same five ideas, five images, five aesthetics, and everything else becomes very, very marginal, right? So how do, so I want to fight that, because I guess, uh, I guess diversity is good, I'm not sure. You know, it, it seems like a good idea, right? Um, so, so that's a question, right? It's not what aesthetics we're going to have. Are we going to have more aesthetics? Are we going to have like more equal distribution as opposed to this kind of power curve where like all the attention goes to the same five ideas, five aesthetics, five memes, you know, five topics, right? Five. But you know, that's okay, because corpora corporation is not a person. Corporation has all my very talented students working for it. Corporation, just because corporation makes different tools, it doesn't mean it's one voice, that's a mistake. No, no, but I mean, for example, it happened with this globalization. What you said is very right. It's the cross everything, like, progressing now, because globalization allows for, like, this um, centralization of capital, and very big corporations run a big culture, for example, in Spain, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you have a lot of small designs. Okay. Now you go Paseo de Gracia Diagonales, in Vitex, in Vitex, in Vitex, in Vitex, in Vitex. That means everybody's okay. going to dress the same. That's not well, homogenization. Not in this room, but this room is an outlier, right? <laughs> But you know, it's, it's, big, it's complicated because I only believe in data, right? And we don't have this data. Like I go to Korea, people dress completely differently. In many, many countries, people take very particular things to globalization, and then we filter their own culture. And I'm sure you're right. There was this kind of flourishing of possibility in the 90s, but did 100 years ago people dressed, people dressed with, like, right? In a more stereotypical way. So it's not like it was, you know, it's, it's, so we need more complex models, right? Yeah. So maybe it was this amazing mo moment in 97. In 2004, but we can't think of it, right? Even me, all I can think about things getting worse or better, right? So how can we teach ourselves to teach, to, how can we teach ourselves to think and to imagine at least 1% is good because the computers can do it. 
but we can't, right? So how can we, in a way, become as good as them? That's kind of, in a way, my paradoxical message, right? How can we think more complex thoughts? And AI, right, it doesn't help right now, it doesn't help, right? It just makes it easier, and it creates this strange feeling of creativity, which is kind of false in a way, right? Because, you know, when you take a picture, you feel creative, but of course, it's all the genius of people who made the camera, right? Anyway, um, so. Sorry, here. Hi. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, one of the things that you talked about was how you analyzed how we are describing a lot of styles, and from styles, we are generating images. And just what uh, Magda was saying, that we have been um, using these prompts in a way to generate images, and images may seem that they are all the same. Do you think that the opposite could happen? Because when we look at art, for example, or when we look at artistic um, expressions, we have our own interpretation of it. But if we start to classify, and if we start to say that a specific artist has X, Y, and Z style, um, the other way around can also happen, which is we're always, always going to classify that, or we're going to create a language that is standardized in a way to talk about a specific uh, expression in art, and art should mean, in theory, uh, whatever it means for us in a way or another. So it is different for me, and it is different for, me, for you, because we have different backgrounds, and we look at it from different perspectives. And I'm coming from a specific uh, experience here, because just like you tried to replicate your past, I tried to help a friend that was ad adopted and he doesn't have any pictures from when he was little. But it just cannot get his hair. And every time I try to uh, explain to it what his hair is, because it is called kinky hair, it doesn't let me do the prompt because kinky is something considered okay. not a word that you can do. Yes. So uh, would oh. we somehow standardize or create a language to describe mm -hmm. images? Uh, just like we are, you know, and did you do that analysis somehow? Yes, yes. yes. So, you know, a very super interesting question. Um, so I'm not, I don't know enough about history, which I regret, but it's too late now, right? <laughs> so with these traditions, right, of describing images, for example, with this idea of a crisis, right? A crisis, so it existed already in ancient Greece. I'm describing images. Uh, there are poems written about paintings, right? There are all the different traditions. Um, there's also a way, right, in which literature, poems, plays, fiction creates images, right? It's very rich images. Uh, and you can think about, I don't know, Beckett, right? And uh, his plays, which take place in this very kind of minimal, empty space, and yet you can imagine all kinds of things, right? So I think this, I mean, I, I did talk about Roland Barthes, and I kind of made this paradoxical argument, but today AI uh, can generate so many variations out of a simple text. But things, I think, are more rich, more complex. And, um, and so, so I think your question is super interesting. If, if assuming that this text-to-image model will continue to nominate, and you know, maybe tomorrow people say, no, we don't have to use this model, right? Like I, I, you know, I use uh, one way, I specify 3D, 3D design of a room, uh, I describe, I, sp I put, I, I um, select colors or from like a menu, the way you do like in 3D software, maybe, okay, but let's say this thing continues. And I think the reason this model is dominant today is that not, not, not everybody in our society is image, is image literate, but, but most people today as opposed to 50 years ago is, we can write, right? We're language literate and that's why I think companies and scientists kind of push these models so that everybody can write. Uh, uh, not like, uh, you know, uh, anyway, right? So question, would people become better, right, at describing images or getting particular facts out of a system? Um, it's very hard to say, right? Uh, I haven't played with much with my journey version five, but I noticed like other people with my old prompts don't work. Because before, right, you know, you make this very short prompt, and if you make a long prompt, the system gets confused because you can only understand like one or two concepts. And now, supposedly, you have to give it the whole paragraph from a book, right? And it kind of understands it. So one possibility is that um, people will become not good at describing images. People will become good at finding places in the world literature, <laughs> right? Or like there's going to be this whole agencies, right, where you go over. And you describe what you want, and there is this like a, you know cool, you know, 72-year-old uh, who used to be a professor of Catalonian language and and, got, you know, and now makes much more money at the company, and she writes this amazing prompt. And when you get the image, right, that would be kind of interesting. 
um, that we will see kind of many renaissance of literature because we have to describe images, right? Uh, that will be interesting, right? I mean, I think your question is super interesting, and I mean, obviously, uh, I can't predict it, but um, uh, I think if this text-image model, right, will continue to dominate for a while, we'll see certain things, right? Um, and I also want to say one more thing. Um, so it occurred to me that um, mm, if you think about art, especially modern art, but not only, right, the relationship between media can go in all kinds of directions. For example, in modernism, right, Scrabbing, Kandinsky, etc., it was very interesting for people to think about relationship between sound and colors. And people made always color organs, etc., right? And then, let's say, in the 90s and 2000s, with a laptop, people started making these laptop performances, right, where you perform music, and music creates with visuals, and vice versa. But right now, right, a kind of type of mapping, I call it media mapping, right, which is dominates in AI, is text, is text to text. So yeah, I can summarize your text, I can expand your text, I can paraphrase your text. Like I don't, I, I can't find GPT-4 useful because every sentence it makes it a bit too generic for me. I use Quillbot all the time, right? Uh, or text to image, right? But you can also imagine tools which will allow you to do shape to image. So you make a shape and then like it turns it into a realistic landscape. Or you, 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 know, you write a song and it, it changes the song into like a thousand page novel, right? So it would be interesting, I think, for us, for artists, for designers, et cetera, to push companies or independent developers to create AI tools which will allow other kinds of mappings as opposed to only here's a text and make a picture, right? Because in a way, you can force the AI to be like illustrator, right? And again, I think it's being popular because more people can write and describe things than draw, uh, but other things will be equally interesting, right? So why not only focus on text and image, why not also bring the shapes and melodies and sound fields, right, and architecture, right? Uh, can we take this building and turn it into a kind of war and peace? Why not, right? That would be interesting. Thank you. Okay. okay.